Sarah, let's talk about what the Buccaneers are saying about a guy that was featured a little bit on Hard Knocks last night, C.D. Lamb. You know, Todd Bowles was asked, how do you stop that trio of receivers, CeeDee Lamb, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup? And he said, simple, you don't play them. Now, that's not going to be an option for Bowles on Thursday night. But Carlton Davis and Sean Murphy Bunting, their cornerbacks, said that they're not preparing for this trio of receivers any differently than they would for any other group of receivers. It was interesting, though, because on Good Morning Football this morning, they were talking about that those receivers could really exploit the Bucks cornerbacks. And I can tell you, if the Bucks cornerbacks heard that segment, they would love it. This is a group that thrives on being the underdogs. They call themselves the Grave Diggers. Now, last year, this past defense on the Bucks was ranked 21st in the league, but that might be a little bit misleading because in the postseason, this was a unit that was lights out. They had seven interceptions. Murphy Bunting had three takeaways just by himself. Davis was asked, why does this group not get any national love? Are you disrespected? And he said, just turn on the film. If players don't know, they will. He's going to get a chance to prove himself on Thursday night, Andrew. Well, Sarah, you saw what those Buccaneers corners did in the Super Bowl when they were disrespected. They really stepped up big time against Tyreek Hill and crew, throwing up the peace signs, the deuces. But the, the reason why they were able to do that, it was, was because of the Bucs pass rush. And that's going to be to, the key to the game. If the Bucs are able to get pressure with JPP, Shaq Barrett, and a young Joe Tryon, Shoyinka, also Vita Vey in there, if they're able to just get pressure with those guys up front, then that makes the job of the corners that much easier. Now, if Dallas is able to block those guys and Tampa Bay has to resort to blitzing, that leaves the corners in one-on-one -on -one situations. If that happens, I like the Cowboys' chances there because, as you mentioned, CeeDee Lamb, I think, is going to be a star. Amari Cooper already is. I don't know if anybody of a third corner can match up with Gallup. So that's the key for the Buccaneers. If that front four can get pressure on their own, let those young corners play mix and match of man and zone, that favors the Bucs tremendously. If they can't and they're left in one-on-one -on -one situations, Andrew, that favors the Cowboys in my view. You know, it's funny, Sarah, you mentioned good morning football motivation. When I was down there during training camp, read a piece about how the Bucs secondary got motivation from a different NFL Network segment last season. We could do a whole show on that at another time, and I'm sure we will. <laughs> Let's get to the injuries here, because yesterday we spoke of the Jordan Whitehead injury. He's out. Mike Edwards is going to be in his place in the secondary. But now that we have another day of practice, there are a couple of things that have popped up here, notably Chris Godwin. I don't think we need to ring the alarm bells on this. Here's what's happened. Godwin appeared on the injury report for the first time yesterday as a limited participant. Now, he has been relatively healthy this entire preseason. That injury report came out after we spoke to Bruce Arians and the Bucks, so he wasn't asked about it. It would be a big surprise, though, if Godwin can't go on Thursday night because of a quad injury. This receiving core for the Buccaneers, I know we were just talking about the Cowboys and what their wide receivers can do, but these Bucks receivers are arguably healthier than they were a year ago. They've got chemistry that they didn't have a year ago. Mike Evans came into this training camp saying he's in the best shape he has ever been in. Godwin, up until now, uh, all reports are he has been feeling great. And then Byron Leftwich talked about Antonio Brown this week. He said, I only got this guy for half a season last year. Now he's got him for 17 games, and hopefully the plan is for more than that. But he says the difference in A.B. now this year is that he knows his role. He knows his position within the game, and that, that should allow you to to see a much more comfortable Antonio Brown than you saw a year ago. And like many of the Bucs, we saw him come on late in the postseason. So the Bucs are hoping all of that a late season magic carrying over to Thursday night. Yeah, Sarah, th those are the things that derail Super Bowl repeats. There there's injuries. The Bucs up to this point, they avoided losing people in free agency. They avoided losing coaches. They avoided any injuries up to this point. Uh, so they're able to step into this season relatively healthy. But the injuries are a factor that they'll have to watch throughout the season. They were the healthiest team in the league last year. But that being said, even if they uh, have a slightly diminished player here or there, they have so many playmakers, as you mentioned, in A.B., uh, and Godwin and Mike Evans and also O.J. Howard is coming back as well, who could be a dynamic playmaker in the offense as well. We, we know Tom Brady can distribute the ball. He likes to do that. So I think that being said, that the Bucs are so strong and so talented in so many key positions. We haven't even gotten to the running back group uh, that they'll be able to overcome 
a loss of two or here if they have a player out for a game or two. That is only if Tom Brady can overcome, you know, the confusing seeing Micah Parsons wearing 11 or Jalen Smith wearing nine he can throw you off. That's sarcasm. Come on. Okay. But anyway, it wasn't funny. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Mark. All right. New right now into our newsroom. Ian Rappaport, Mike Garofolo. Uh Mike just finishing up lunch. Mike, what was that, by the way? That looked really good. No, really. It looked good. I'm not, I'm not calling you out. I'm famished. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> this should have been the lead, by the way. Tuna melt. Tuna melt wrap. It looked good. Sorry, you guys. All right, we were slated for two minutes from now. Well, I know. While we finish lunch, Ian, uh, Carson Wentz, good to go week one. I mean, a month ago, if we had told you that Carson Wentz would be good to go, that there'd be no doubt, like Wednesday morning, he's good. I think everybody would have been been stunned. Well, we started to get inclinations toward this and a little bit of clues from Carson Wentz when a couple days after the surgery, not even a week, he was out at practice standing there without a walking boot, was moving around fine. And what we were told was that he wouldn't really be able to do anything for two weeks. But there he was, just kind of walking. And then uh, about a week or so after that, he participated in practice and kind of looked pretty good. And so, you know, there's always a race to to confirm when a guy's playing, to report different things. And, you know, with Carson Wentz, it's never officially been said he's been cleared for week one, but it's like we all have known it because he has looked excellent in practice, doesn't seem like he's in a lot of pain. He's rebounded from back-to-back days. He's expected, according to Coach Frank Reich, to be a full participant in practice today, the most important practice day on Wednesday before week one. This guy is playing, and, you know, about four weeks from was a pretty significant surgery in his foot, Mike. The Colts don't have to worry about their battle to replace Carson Wentz. They just have Carson Wentz. Yeah, and the mobility has been key. You see from those clips, he has looked like the guy that has been able to throw on the move, get out of piles when it seemed like the play was over in his time in Philly. I mean, that's when things were going really well, and that's what the Colts are hopeful that they're getting back. And that was the point of the surgery because – Playing through it and managing it, his mobility was going to be extremely limited this upcoming season. So the hope was, once he was cleared and ready to return from injury, that he would have that mobility that is such a key part of his game. Even if he's not running, just the the ability to buy more time and to do things on the run. So that's a big thing. Not only has he been cleared, he actually looks pretty good like his normal self heading into week one. Here's the rest of this. Rap, by the way. Yeah, I, I, I did you dirty here, Mike. Because, I, I, see, I could, you know, behind the curtain here, I could see everyone's camera up here on TVs. And so I saw Mike chowing down, and it looked good. I didn't expect you to have food in your mouth and be unable to speak. I was just going to ask, what was it? Because it, it looked good. What was it? It's right. done now. Was. Let's get to Pittsburgh, where they may or may not be eating sandwiches with coleslaw and fries on top of them today and inside them. Um, ben Roethlisberger went out there today, Ian. He... he You don't often get in the middle of someone's contract negotiations, and Roethlisberger kind of did that with T.J. Watt. He said, and we're waiting for a Watt extension before game one, Steelers don't negotiate during the season, that T.J. Watt should get whatever the heck he wants. That's that's bold. Yeah, Ben doesn't care. I mean, he really doesn't. And I'm sure... You know, I'm sure Kevin Colbert and the rest of these Steelers executives are kind of rolling their eyes at, at Ben offering some contract negotiation advice to an organization that's done a lot of these. But his point isn't wrong. T.J. Watt deserves all of the money. And if this deal gets done, Mike, he's likely to be, he will be the highest paid defensive player in football. He is one of the best players in football regardless of position. So whatever he gets he has earned and he deserves it's still up in the air though is this thing actually going to get done and there has been uh, certainly some debate and discussion mike about guaranteed money and the steelers the way they do contracts don't often guarantee money into the second year is tj watt going to be a guy who is going to take a very hard line on contract negotiations uh we will see but i would say this from what i know i don't know for sure right now that he's going to be practicing and fully gearing up for week one until this thing gets done. And the Steelers' policy of not having guarantees beyond year one, I've spoken to agents throughout the the morning, uh, agents not connected to the T.J. Watt thing, who are rooting for T.J. Watt and his agents on this one because 
it drives them nuts. And they're not the only team that does it. Cincinnati does it. Green Bay does it. Um, now, in Ben Roethlisberger's case, he got injury guarantees. So at least he got a little something going forward. And it's not like the Steelers were going to cut him. So full guarantees didn't necessarily mean that much to Roethlisberger. In TJ Watt's case, he's looking at Joey Bosa's deal because remember, you're always comparing it to the other guys at your position. Bosa's got fully guaranteed money essentially into the third new year of his contract. And the Steelers are saying, no, we want to keep the fully guaranteed money in year one. It really only makes it harder for them, which is why I don't understand this archaic way of thinking. That's the word that agents are using when I ask them about it because now you have to load up the signing bonus and you have to increase the salaries year by year by year to make the player feel good, you're basically conceding a point on your own by having this policy of, hey, we're not going to guarantee money into the future. So that's why this is a difficult one to do, because T.J. Watt is looking at Bosa's deal, he's looking at Roethlisberger getting injury guarantees, and he's saying, hey, if this is your policy, then you better give me even more in the signing bonus and more per year on the non-guaranteed salaries. Well, if you don't want to break that policy, maybe you would consider breaking the policy of negotiating during the season so that there isn't such a hard deadline. I highly doubt they would break either, but week one, Steelers-Bills is this Sunday in Buffalo. T.J. Watt is on the final year of his rookie contract, which is the fifth-year option. All right, Ian, let's talk about this trade that today David Culley says we're talking, nothing is confirmed, nothing is done, and that is Bradley Roby from the Texans to the Saints. But as Culley points out, Roby suspended he wasn't going to play week one anyway. Yeah, they may still be talking, but my understanding is this deal is going to happen. Bradley Roby, the former first-rounder, very, very good corner, was slated to be a starter for the Houston Texans, is expected to be traded from the Texans to the Saints. And for the Texans, you're right, he wasn't going to play week one. I'm not sure how much this maybe changes things for them. For the Saints, this is a very important deal. The Saints are a really good team. Their defense should be excellent, just like last year. They just needed a starting corner. We all thought they were going to address it in the draft. They did not. This is essentially the missing piece for the Saints defense. Not going to play week one because he's suspended, but week two and beyond, Bradley Roby should be massive for New Orleans. Also, David Culley today saying, yes, confirming, Deshaun Watson will not play. Nick Casario said the same thing on the radio. Neither, you know, wants to give any thought on a plan beyond week one, but he is not playing week one. The label is the label. The standard is the standard. The game is the game here. Tua Tungavailoa, Mac Jones, the first time we're going to have two Alabama quarterbacks squaring off against each other since Richard Todd and Kenny Stabler on a Monday night game in 1983, which is absurd. James Palmer got to hear a little bit there from Mac Jones, uh, said all the right things, said all the things a rookie quarterback should say. Also got some insight as to how he learned the playbook. Yeah, this is nothing new to Mac Jones. You heard him say that uh, he's going to always do the way things have gone and nothing changes. Well, this is something he was doing at Alabama, working with his girlfriend on the playbook. They go over it together. They're going in the backyard and they're doing walkthroughs in a sense. And when I went down and did his pro days, I was told the same thing. Late at night, she would come into the Alabama practice facility with him, and she would yell plays to him, and he would diagram them up on the board. He's a very visual learner, likes to see it, likes to do it, likes to walk through it, and she has always helped him with this. And this is kind of one of the things, Andrew, that kind of always set him apart in some of the people's minds down at Alabama, this ability to go and do extra work on his own. And they believe that is tied to his past career as a tennis player. He was a very good tennis player player Andrew and they believe that's where he got a lot of this self-drive and this mental toughness because out on the court there's nobody to blame but yourself you're all alone and that's where he got a lot of this and now his girlfriend is you know once again helping him with this time that he takes by himself at his apartment in Tuscaloosa there was an, uh, an extra room that was full of playbooks from past years at Alabama he would go over by himself so this extra work by himself, he's just carrying it over to New England, and she's doing it with him. He was a tennis player, um, a pretty good tennis player. At one point, Dad said he got to stop yelling at the chair, uh, the chair ump, though, and stop throwing rackets. Yeah. 
and he eventually switched. <laughs> Dad to was a really good tennis player. Dad was Dad, an amazing. Dad played tennis in qualifying player. matches at Wimbledon in the French Open. Mac Jones, also a child model, appeared in local Jacksonville area TV commercials for like <laughs> car dealerships and stuff. The stuff is on YouTube. Look that it up. happened. James Palmer, great insight there. Thank you, sir. Wallet, Alabama. These are pretty good numbers a year ago. The guy waited his chance, and then, well, you know, Mac Jones did. He won. Will he win this year? Will the Patriots be a playoff team? Funny you ask that. Cynthia Freeland's been crunching the numbers, not only for the Patriots. Hi, Cynthia. Game theory at all 32 teams. But let's open with the Patriots. Win projections. Do you see them as a playoff team? I see them as a wild card team with the child model under center. I did not know that before I just learned it last segment. I have 9.4 wins projected for the Patriots. Now, that sounds weird because obviously you can't win point four of a game. But remember, everything this year is right around 8.5. That's the average. So things above that means a better chance to make the playoffs. So for me right now, they are the wild card team. So that is a very nice projection. I, again, the, the whole girlfriend thing, maybe he should get some sleep. And then maybe go back to child. I don't know. That I, I didn't know all those facts. I think it's kind of charming, though, like walking through the backyard and going through plays, calling out protections. I think it's nice. You know, I mean, it brings <laughs> couples together. All right, let's so bring romantic. The, it, it is. Let's bring the <laughs> AFC North together. Last year, the Browns were a wild card team. Win projection for them. And then and tell me about the Steelers, too, if you could. Okay, so for the Browns, they're going to be very happy with me. I have them forecasted to win the AFC North in part because of their improved secondary. They went from the 25th ranked unit to the best or the fourth best unit for me. So that the best improvement for anyone. When you look at Miles Garrett's efficiency with that and that front ability to bring the heat, that really helps out because the back and the front they work together. They're projected for for 10.9 wins. Ooh, that is a nice high win total. Cleveland's going to be happy with me. And then we can just maybe skip over the Steelers not being happy with me because when I look at their win total, it's a little dicey, 8.4. So right now that has them not making the playoff. They do make it in 36.8% of simulations, which means that there are opportunities. This is not a foregone conclusion that they're not good or anything like that. It would really help if TJ Watt were signed, sealed, and delivered and absolutely going to be out there. That's a big difference. This is a tough conference, which means the opportunity for them to win is really going to take all of their best players playing. Let's deliver on the tease now from last segment. And I said, what if I told you the Seahawks aren't making the playoffs? I'm not going to. Somebody else will. It's not just the Seahawks, Cynthia. You have the Saints with a projection of getting left out. Okay, so everyone hates me, and let's start with New Orleans. So the New Orleans projection is 8.7 wins. Why? There's a lot of chaos to start this season. This is not an anti Jameis Winston take in any stretch of the imagination, but it is a a lot of change means a lot of opportunity for, you know, boom or bust. I love their defense, but there are a lot of questions on offense. No Michael Thomas, not no problem. That's a problem. It's going to be a, take a little bit of time, even when Michael Thomas does come back, for them to get in sync. So that is very difficult in kind of an interesting situation with their schedule, too. So their schedule doesn't help them out. And last but not least, the most difficult division in all of football, the NFC West. I realistically think that all four of these teams have a sh chance. No other division has a chance for all four teams to make it to the playoffs. But for me, the Seahawks, they are last 8.6 games forecasted due to the defense, not Russell Wilson. A defense that will now face Carson Wentz week number one in Indianapolis. Thank you, Cynthia Freeland's win projections right now. Don't hate her on NFL.com. I'm talking about your weekly article, Mark, which deals with underdogs. And I don't mean underdogs in the we're now allowed to talk about underdog sense, but more so in in storylines that that need more attention and themes that deserve more appreciation, right? Yeah, I think we all understand what an underdog is, but it's kind of looking for whether it's players, coaches, teams, and situations, you know, on a weekly basis where they're backed up against the wall. And here in week one, we've got a couple of them. Like, for example, the Lions with an entirely new staff dealing with Kyle Shanahan and his mind games with his two quarterbacks. 
Absolutely. You know, I, I have to let you know that I was in the hospital a couple of weeks ago. I'm totally fine now, but I was on a heavy Dilaudid drip. That is a very powerful drug that takes you deep into other solar systems. And that is the mind state I was in when I was watching Kyle Shanahan unfurl those first two drives with both Trey Lance and Jimmy G at quarterback. And I honestly, it, I, it, I, could, I could not comprehend what I was seeing. It was so freaky and so beautiful. I think Kyle Shanahan right now is sitting around uh, in bunkers with you know empty cartons of Chinese food, laughing his head off at what he can do with these two quarterbacks. And if you're Aaron Glenn, the first year coordinator of the Detroit Lions with a secondary that is extremely young, extremely inexperienced, you've got to be thinking to yourself, how do you stop this scenario? Being the guinea pig against this Niners offense is no fun. Well, I'm glad you're okay, first off. Second of all, I, I have this image here of you as like the 10th perfect stranger in the new show, Nine Perfect Strangers with hallucinations of 49ers zone reads. You're not I, wrong. You haven't seen the show. You don't get it. Okay. Um, the Giants offense, big year, Garrett, Daniel Jones, all that's coming to town is Vic Fangio and a defense that did not allow a touchdown, if you care, to any team in three preseason games. Yeah, it's, it's arguably the best secondary in the league. And the Giants, I mean, if any team in the league has had a slow start during camp, all reports about the G-men were that the offense was just sluggish. You know, Saquon Barkley, obviously, we don't know what kind of workload we're going to get from him. Evan Ingram, as he is wont to do, is out of the mix. Kadarius Toney, the rookie wideout, barely played in the preseason, could have a big role in week one. Kenny Galladay has barely practiced with Daniel Jones, who they want a big leap from. Kenny Galladay told reporters recently, look, uh, here's the deal. This offense might start slow. I mean, he's basically telling that to us before it happens. So I'd be very concerned about this offense's scenario, especially we just talked about Kyle Shanahan. Jason Garrett is not the creative um, artist that Kyle Shanahan is, and I think that hampers them as well. The offensive line has issues from tackle to tackle. So I don't like their situation against the Denver defense that could be top five in the league, if not top three or top two. We've talked a lot about the Browns' defensive makeover here. They get Patrick Mahomes, no big deal, week number one. Um, amazing note here in The Athletic this morning about just how much change there's been on that defense. From the divisional round game last year, Browns lost to the Chiefs. Only four defensive players that started that day are even still on the team. Four that started that day are not currently on NFL rosters. And one, Carl Joseph, is on the Steelers' practice squad. That is turnover. It is. You know, I think that Andrew Barry signed a lot of one-year contract players a year ago. They knew transition was coming. John Johnson, Troy Hill, Greg Newsom, the first-round draft pick at cornerback, Grant Delpit, Greedy Williams come back. So I like the situation for Cleveland's defense, but you're playing the Chiefs. They're still the Chiefs. And you just wonder, can all these faces combine and operate in concert in week one against the toughest opponent you could draw in the AFC? Cam, what's the latest on Julio Jones' health and his status for week one? Yeah, we just stepped away from the Titans practice field a few minutes ago, and Julio, for the consecutive practice days, was doing extensive work really since the first time since the week one of training camp. And I asked Mike Vrabel earlier today about is Julio going to be ready full go week one? And he was non-committal, but he did say that he's going to be able to work guys in throughout their roles. We saw him go through some footwork drills. It looked like he was running to be 100%. The one question here has been chemistry. He hasn't done a lot of practice work. What's his chemistry going to be like with Ryan Tannehill? Well, Tannehill told us that he's watched extensive tape of Julio this offseason, and he's seen exactly how he goes through different route concepts. So he feels like chemistry won't be an issue. Either way, there's a lot of excitement here in Nashville about Julio Jones, A.J. Brown, Derrick Henry, and this new-look Titans offense. Yeah, Cam, you're right. I think that the chemistry, you mentioned the chemistry. I think last year proved with the lack of practice with teams that it was a huge concern leading up to it, but you saw a high quality of play once the season started. So I think that's the encouraging thing for the Titans and most teams. But what's fascinating to me is I think the Titans have to stay with their formula of Derrick Henry and then have A.J. Brown and Julio Jones make plays off of that. Ryan Tannehill sprinkle in playmaking throughout that, but stick with the formula of Derrick Henry, especially against this Arizona defense, who has two young inside linebackers in rookie Zayvon Collins and second-year man Isaiah Simmons, who kind of struggled in that kind of role of the taking the downhill sort of run-stopping stop, ability. So that'll be fascinating. And as you know, Andrew, if you come at the King, you best not miss. And those young Arizona linebackers better not miss.
No, Sunday. They, be, they better not miss, but if, if they do, that means Tennessee controls the clock and keeps Kyler Murray off the field. What are the Titans there, Cam, saying about Kyler and that Arizona offense? Yeah, goal number one is to contain number one. That's what Titans defense lineman Jeffrey Simmons said. And look, when I talk to these guys about Kyler Murray, their eyes kind of widen. They know what he can do with his arm, with his legs. And I talked to uh, safety Amani, Amani Hooker, and he told me, look, it's like backyard football when you're playing Kyler Murray. You have to stay on your keys. You have to know exactly where your de your receiver is. You can't let him go because Kyler keeps plays alive. So their goal was mitigating Kyler's legs first and then mitigating his arm. They know it's a difficult challenge. This is a Titan secondary that didn't play as well as they wanted to last year. So the focus has been having tighter coverage and really playing muscle up with their receiver with the receivers that are going against DeAndre Hopkins and AJ Green. So they view this as a big challenge and really really a motivation to show that they're better than they put on tape last year. Well, Cameron, yeah, Kyler Murray obviously is one of the unique playmakers in the NFL at the quarterback position. But when I looked at the Cardinals offense last year, they really did not have a lot of creativity for as much as Cliff Kingsbury had as an innovator. They really lined you know, DeAndre Hopkins up in the same spot almost 80, 85 percent of the time. They didn't have a lot of motion and movement. They didn't kind of utilize the playmakers to their strengths. So I'm going to look for if the Arizona uh, offense has evolved to become more multifaceted and to use their playmakers and not just rely on, hey, Kyler, you go out there and make plays and make this offense run because that's what it kind of looked like in the second half of the season, Andrew. So that'll be fascinating if the Titans defense has to face a more multidimensional Arizona offense. It remains to be seen if it will be. Great job, Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks breaking it down on their podcast this week. Mark, to your point about the absolute lack of motion on that Arizona offense, as little as any team in the NFC, if not the NFL. All right, we're talking about Aaron Rodgers now. Quarterback that has led his team to 26 regular season wins and back-to-back -back appearances in the NFC Championship game. Now he and Matt LaFleur get ready for the Saints in Jacksonville. I try to take it one day at a time with the, with the group, but I'll tell you the one thing that you love about this group is just the way they come to work each and every day, the energy, the attitude. I feel like they're, they're putting in the work, but again, it, it's a new season. So every year you gotta, you get, you hit the reset button and you, you gotta, you gotta go out there and do it. You gotta prove it. They hit the reset button in a place they did not expect to be. Stacy Dales, Mark Ross now with me on NFL now, Stacy, that is in, in Jacksonville as Matt LaFleur gets his team ready to face Sean Payton and the Saints. What is Sean Payton saying about getting Aaron Rodgers week one? Well, there's no better way to start, right, in getting the Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers. These two teams had the best record in the NFC a season ago. We saw them a season ago in week three, so also in the early goings and onset. And I asked Sean Payton earlier today, you know, how have you gone about the process of – planning for the Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers. And he talked about the logistics. They're trying to find their feet really in the Dallas area, uh, get into the meat and potatoes, if you will. He told me of their game planning and strategizing for Rodgers and company. But the thing that really jumps off the page, Andrew and Mark, is the fewest giveaways in the National Football League, Peyton said. Number one, just 11 giveaways last season. They have tremendous leadership, obviously uh, several veterans despite some youth, and we're gonna see Josh Myers start at center and possibly Royce Newman at guard, two rookies for the Green Bay Packers. But at the end of the day, Mark, Sean Payton said, it comes down in the early stages of a season to who makes the fewest errors. If you remember that week three game back in New Orleans last year, the Saints had eight penalties for 83 yards. The Packers just two penalties for only 10 yards. So uh, we just saw it with the college football kicking off, right? Uh, fewest mistakes, special teams, you name it. That's what the game will come down to, Peyton said. You're right, Stacey. In over 20 years in the NFL, the head coach, the last thing he always says for team goes out, we don't turn the ball over. We don't turn the ball over, we'll win. <laughs> and obviously that's a key in any game, but specifically Aaron Rodgers. Sean Payton's been around to know, look, I'm not going to go into a game and just completely shut Aaron Rodgers down, but what are the things that we can do to make him uncomfortable? How can we hang into, into this game and then make the plays on our own? It'll be interesting, interesting to see how Jameis Winston steps up how big of a role he'll have, and then also if they'll still sprinkle in Taysom Hill. So hang in the game, hopefully mistake at the end, and the Saints make plays. 
on their side of the ball, Andrew. All right. Uh, what are the the Packers saying, Stacy? They have a new D.C., Joe Barry, formerly of the Rams, who back in 2018 had a couple of huge games against the Saints. That was against Drew Brees, however. This is about Jameis Winston. What are they saying about preparing for this offense? Well, the Packers defensively, Andrew, uh, have tremendous respect for Sean Payton, first of all. Uh, one of you know one of those coaches that will be in the Hall of Fame one day, Jameis Winston. They're concerned about his arm and his ability to strike downfield. Uh, this is a tremendous offensive line, uh, one of the top five you could argue in the National Football League. And you think about their two bookends in in uh, Teron Armstead and Ryan Ramchek. Everything in between is exceptional as well. We think, Mark, they're going to launch the ball down the field. I mean, I mentioned it in my last report, but. Uh, they played a lot of short game with Drew Brees, and now you have this this guy with a cannon for an arm. And what's really interesting, if you go back to that 2019 season uh, and Jameis Winston when he threw for those 5,100 plus yards, only four of his interceptions were on deep passes. He is accurate down the field, and I expect whether they're post, you know, routes. Uh, downfield with these receivers and tight ends, and certainly Alvin Kamara or crossing routes. I think they're going to extend those, uh, and maybe we'll see glimpses of that here on Sunday with the New Orleans Saints and their offense. You're right, Stacey. You can't say the offense will be better with Drew Brees, but it'll just be different. And as you mentioned, because of the deep ball that Jameis has, and you saw that in the preseason where he had some huge plays down the field with his arm showcasing that, and also couple that with the fact of Green Bay's corner situation the last we saw Kevin King in the NFC Championship game had some struggles that you know kind of cost him the game a little bit. They drafted Eric Stokes out of Georgia, the corner in the first round. How much of a role will he play? Or will King be in there? But you better believe that Sean Payton is definitely staying away from Jair Alexander and going to target that other corner spot with Jameis's deep ball uh, uh, prowess there, Andrew. A would-be NFC Championship game preview week number one. I know that seems like, you know, four months away because it is but it'll be good saints packers in jacksonville where there's a 30 percent chance of afternoon thunderstorms because of course there are it's september in florida all right let's get back to some of the other games here there's kirk cousins on the practice field here as the vikings get ready for the Bengals. this game's interesting mike zimmer against one of the teams for which he was an assistant kirk cousins joe burrow that's one o'clock on fox I think by nature of being in this league, you're just always studying tape, you're watching film, you're watching games, and so you just watch with an observant eye. It's hard for me to watch a game like I used to as a kid, as a fan of football. You watch it more as a student of the game and as a quarterback, so you're looking at it with a little bit more of a uh, unique perspective. And, um, you know, he did a great job last year at the unfortunate injury, but, uh, you know, between his, his uh, college career and, and what he did as a rookie, he's off to a great start, and, and he's got a lot of great football ahead of him, I would guess. Kirk Cousins and Joe Burrow. How about Andy Dalton and Matthew Stafford? It is Andy Dalton, right? Yes, it is. He is still the starter, despite the fact that Sean McVay says they have to prepare for a little Justin Field. But don't think Dalton's looking over his shoulder. That's the worst thing you could do is look over your shoulder. And so, uh, you know, I think that's understanding that is is key. How about tuning out the stuff that you don't need to focus on and knowing where you need to put your time and effort and all that kind of stuff. I think that's just where I'm at, and you don't worry about all the all the other stuff. All the other stuff. We'll worry about that on Sunday night. How about the Bills and the Steelers yet again? They faced each other the last two years, both years. That game was won by the Bills. Here we go again. We know that it's going to be a it's going to be a tight game. The last couple of years, obviously, they've been you know kind of uh, boxing matches, taking a couple hits here or there, giving them out. Um, they're extremely well coached. They're a very talented group on defense. Um, you know, they got a Hall of Fame quarterback over there. So we got to be you know on top of our game and go out there and try to execute to the best of our abilities. Um, but we know that they're going to bring it. You know, game one. Um, you know, they they were extremely good last year. They're going to be extremely good this year. So we know that. And again, we got to we got to go out there and execute. You know what, there's a chance that also is an AFC Championship game preview. This game is a preview of two playoff teams, I think, potentially. The Cardinals and Ryan Tannehill and the Tennessee Titans. 
Here's Mike Vrabel moments ago. I'm excited for, for us, for our football team. I'm excited for our fans. I'm excited to, to get into the stadium with, with some fans, with our fans. Um, and just excited to, to coach the football team. And a part of that is, you know, that group that you mentioned, you know, some of those, those receivers. Um, but it's, it, it's everybody out there doing their job, and, and they're a part of it. You know, just, just excited to get everybody that we have available back. And we're excited to be live in Nashville here to say hi to Cameron Wolf covering the Titans as they get ready for the Cardinals. Cam, what is Julio Jones' health status this week, and how's that chemistry looking with Ryan Tannehill? Well, some of that chemistry building is going on right now at the practice field. Julio Jones has been really ramping it up for the first time since the first week of practice. And we saw him out there on the field. He looked like he was running full go. He looked healthy. And Mike Vrabel wouldn't commit fully to him being having a full workload. But he said as of now, he's planning for that. I thought what was interesting about that chemistry building we were talking about is for the three weeks that Julio Jones was not practicing, they spent parts of practice. Ryan Tannehill, Julio, and A.J. Brown working on the top of their break really to work on their timing, even though Julio wasn't a full go at that point. And Tannehill took it a step further. He spent time earlier this offseason watching tape of Julio to figure out exactly what the receiver looked like. And what impressed him is that he was an elite receiver at his size coming out of transitions and breaks. So there's already early excitement about what they can do together, together as a group. So this Tennessee offense already has Derrick Henry, A.J. Brown. Now Julio's that third piece they hope can take them over the top. And they'll get their first shot Sunday against the Cardinals. Kyler Murray and the Arizona Cardinals. Kyler's on the podium right now in Arizona. Maybe try to work that in later as well. We get the Titan side of it from Cameron Wolf. Thanks, Cam. Your thoughts watching from Florida on Jalen Hurts. Do you think he can be the guy the Eagles need? I do. I do. I know we haven't seen a, a large percentage of him on the field of how operating, but just listening to what this dude talks about, his work ethic, and what is coming out of the locker room and guys talking about him, about his leadership already, and then his willingness, I believe, to look at the things that he's not doing to better himself. Because, again, he's, he had been supplanting in different places at Alabama, and so he's had to look at some of the things that he was lacking in be okay with getting better at it in order to earn the respect somewhere else. So that tells you that this dude has been through a whole lot in his short career already, and now he's stepping into one of the, 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 the tougher places to play in Philadelphia. And I can, I can tell that the Eagles fan are leaning towards loving this dude. Blessed by the best, my journey to Canton and beyond. Hall of Famer Brian Dawkins, class of 2018. The book drops on Friday. Great to have you. Great to see you, Brian. Good luck with this and good luck with everything else. Let's get back to week one and some of these matchups. Good one coming up in Indianapolis between Russell Wilson of the Seahawks and that man Carson Wentz and the Colts. Wentz is on the field today. This video is from August, but he is a full go in practice. And five weeks after foot surgery, he is going to play week one. This week now, we're really focused on Seattle. So we're really going against the scout team. These plays are really that much more important. Um, and so being out here this week, uh, I think, is, is a big uh, piece of the puzzle, really, because we're really going um, against full go against Seattle with the game plan and everything. So obviously, you want to take all the physical reps you can get. But, but here we are. It's game week, and it's time to go. And here we are with Ryan Fitzpatrick as the new quarterback for the Washington football team. This is the sneaky good game of the day. That defense against Justin Herbert and the Chargers, more on that in a second. But how about the fact that Ryan Fitzpatrick will start an opener for his sixth different team, which is like a new NFL record. It's a huge honor to be one of the 32 guys that is leading a team into, into action on Sunday. Um, to be a starting quarterback in the NFL is such a, a privilege, and I'm so honored and humbled to be able to do it. And so it's definitely not something that I take lightly. It's not a responsibility I take lightly, but it's also not something I take for granted. This is something I've worked very hard to do. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people in and outside of this building that are counting on me to go out there and perform. So. It's a it's a huge honor and something that, uh, especially you know, week one, getting out there, getting the season started the right way, uh, it's it's a very big deal for me. 
this was also a- not taken for granted. Hi there, Kimberly Jones at Ashburn. Mark Ross back with us as well. Not taking for granted that uh, week one is going to be magical, that he's going to be Fitz magic. What's he saying about feeling comfortable yeah. in this Scott Turner system? Yeah, I think that Ryan Fitzpatrick can integrate into any system, Andrew. He's proven that now, what, entering his 17th NFL season, which is remarkable. You know, as part of that sound that you just played, I believe Fitz ended up by saying, essentially, I know this is a boring answer. Ryan, I rarely connect a guy, uh, correct a guy from Harvard. That was not a boring answer. It was a fantastic answer. I love hearing about the gratitude. He was asked by another member of the media about how he approaches his career. And he said, if you followed my career at all, you know, I'm pretty much a week to week guy. Well, these weeks right now are really cool for the Fitzpatrick family, Andrew and Mark, because they got they got jerseys made. They've had a lot of jerseys made over the years. Ryan and his wife have seven children. Angie, uh, the oldest is 12, the youngest is one. And Ryan told us today that on the back of those jerseys, some of the kids chose dad, some chose daddy, some chose uh, Fitz, Fitz Magic. And Fitz Magic is what he hopes to bring to this Washington football team. Well, Kim, that fits magic is him being able to keep going with all these different teams who keep signing him as a starting <laughs> quarterback because, as you mentioned, all the teams he's been on, but none of them have led to a playoff berth. And he has uh, under 30 wins, a uh, win-loss record, 30 more wins than losses in his career. So the Fitz magic is his personality. He's so smart and cerebral. Coaches get him. We want him to lead our team, but it hasn't produced wins. And that's a big concern for me with this, as wonderful as he is, that they may have the best defense in the NFL. Can he do enough uh, to, uh, to, to compromise with that deal? With how dominant will they have to be to overcome if he is the same Fitz magic of making the turnovers and the mistakes up and down roller coasters during the seasons that he's had some of those seasons starting out as the starter but not finishing as the starter so that'll be the intriguing part this season for washington how dominant their defense will be compared to what ryan fitzpatrick will give them uh, that he's shown throughout his 17 seasons andrew there's also a concern as to who ryan fitzpatrick is going to throw to yes they have weapons here but kim they had hoped and, and it was fingers crossed. He hadn't practiced all summer to get Curtis Samuel out there. Samuel went out onto the field today, but it didn't last long. Yeah, we saw him on the practice field. It was while, while reporters were still watching, Andrew. And he, he essentially limped off. I don't want to be overly dramatic about it, but certainly that groin issue that, that cropped up this spring uh, has not clearly gone away. So Ron Rivera essentially said, we'd love to have him out there, but we have plenty of other weapons. And indeed they do. One really, really quick note about one of those weapons who we don't really talk about, and that's 6'5 Cam Sims. Fitzpatrick told us today that he was watching film at the this spring and Cam Sims kept kept jumping off the screen to him. He's an enormous target, an enormous catch radius. So Fitzpatrick reached out to Alex Smith and said, am I seeing this right? And Smith told Fitzpatrick, you're seeing it right. Cam Sims could be a great weapon for you. We'll see how that part goes. Well, of course, you want to have your full complement of playmakers when you go into any game. Curtis Samuel, they signed him in the offseason for a reason. Part of that, I think, is because of the versatility, not your just typical wide receiver, but get the ball in his hands in multiple ways. Also, a player like Antonio Gibson, really excellent complement to take the pressure off of Fitzpatrick where he doesn't always have to try to push the ball down the field. Uh, Also, Logan Thomas fits into that mold. So when you take one of those guys away, the other guys have to elevate their play. Uh, and that kind of takes away from the strength of the offense. Uh, but hopefully this for the long run uh, for, for Curtis Samuel, they can get him back sooner rather than later. But this definitely compromises them uh, going into this game, Andrew. This is a good one. Washington and the Chargers. Week one, Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern time on CBS. Kim Jones there in Ashburn. Mark Ross, thank you both. Another NFC East team facing an AFC West team making the long flight. Teddy Bridgewater and the Broncos go to New York to face the Giants. Bridgewater won that job a couple of weeks ago. Beat out Drew Locke, and he is the unquestioned number one quarterback now. We go to Denver to that building, Englewood, Colorado here. James Palmer, hello. What is Teddy Bridgewater saying about his week one approach? 
He says, Andrew, he's going to be the same calm, cool, collected guy he is when he goes out on the field. But they do know what they're walking into with the anniversary of 9-11, the environment in New York that is going to be there, and their emphasis to getting off to a fast start. This has been Bridgewater's mantra to the rest of this team, a sense of urgency over the last couple of weeks. They really went after it throughout the preseason, won their preseason games, and want that to carry into September because they haven't won a September game under Vic Fangio over the last two years. And he also believes that if you get out to a quick start with all the weapons they have, it will be a nightmare for opposing teams when you look at the Broncos' defense that they're going to be going up against if the Broncos get early leads. But an issue for week one will be the health of Bradley Chubb. He injured his ankle in the preseason finale two weeks ago, not the one that was surgically repaired, the other one. It's kind of gone backwards this week, to my understanding. He'll be off to the side. We might have to wait another week. We haven't seen Bradley Chubb and Vaughn Miller on the field together since 2018. Interesting one to monitor. Vic Fangio, however, does mm-hmm. say that Vaughn Miller does look, uh, look good, and he is ready to go mm-hmm. for week number one. James, you're actually going to be at the Jaguars-Texans game week number one. That's in yeah. Houston. Trevor Lawrence was named the team captain today. Today, one of seven named by Urban Meyer, voted upon by the players. Here's what Lawrence had to say about that. We've been working since OTA, so it's been a few months in the works of trying to get this thing rolling, and we feel like we're in a really good spot. The team's gelling. Um, we just got a lot of good dudes on the team, hard workers, and it's, it's cool to be around. You know, you hear a lot of different things in college about the NFL and how guys only care about you know, getting paid, and as long as they they have a good contract and they're, you know, getting their money, they don't really care. But that, we just don't have guys like that here. So that hasn't been my experience at all. Um, and it, I think that's cool to be on a team like that. What's his experience going to be week one in Houston? James, what else is Trevor Lawrence saying about that one? Well, Andrew, he said this game, just like all other first games, he's going to have some butterflies. And he said he actually would maybe like to get hit pretty early on to maybe knock those out and get rolling. But the big thing, obviously, is preparing for week one is different, as he mentioned, than OTAs and training camp. But he's using the exact same formula and really routine and schedule that he used heading into that final preseason game against the Cowboys, where we saw him play so well. It was against the Cowboys' backups, but threw the ball brilliantly. He's using all of that in terms of his order of preparation for this week one but he likes the game plan that's been put in for this Texans defense that he said is not going to try to fool me a whole lot but they're very sound in what they do and if they're not trying to mix it up a lot that means they're always in the right place tight windows says he's not lobbying to use his legs but he is faster than most people believe he is Andrew and if he's going to get out and run he will do that week one he is ready uh, to go with the game plan they are putting in place this week